find your Bibles and find the book of 2 Kings. It's in the Old Testament. You're saying, where is that? Well, it's after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. So just kind of keep flipping on through the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Torah or the Pentateuch or wherever you want to call it, then Joshua, Judges, Ruth. But I need you in this text. Like, I need you to have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible this morning, I'm okay with stealing. Steal the, one besi- the person beside you. <laughs> right? Like, we need to have a Bible in our hands. Uh, do you understand? Maybe, do you, do you know this? We sort of break all the laws of how they tell you to grow a church. Did you know that? Like, for instance, we go a little longer in worship, and they say to preach anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. I'm like, ah, ah. And so we're going 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, always have. Because, listen, we only have 45 minutes to wake the dead. <laughs> 20 minutes doesn't do it. 20 minutes is just hooking up the battery cables. And it takes me another 25 minutes just to say, oh, night, now you're with me. All right? And so we break all the rules, but we are making disciples. And you guys, can I just, I want to tell you thank you. Uh, you have made it through 23. Today is the 24th sermon on the 24th. Didn't plan it that way, but the 24th sermon in the series, Thy Kingdom. And it was an intense series trying to learn a, a topic that honestly you could spend you could spend the rest of your entire Christian walk still figuring out and learning what kingdom authority means. So 24 sermons in a topic that describes the victorious Christian life is not that much. But we tried to hit what we thought, what I thought, according to the scriptures, were topics that we all deal with. Now, this one today, I have been waiting on this one for a while. I think I'll wait on every sermon, but I, wait, I, I am excited um, about this one. As you can see, we actually have props. And uh, so we need a moving target later today. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. Right, um, But anyway, we have props. It's, it's for a purpose. These arrows were used about, I don't know, four or five years ago, um, and we brought them back, um, and they're significant for a reason for the scripture that we're looking at this morning. Here's what we're talking about. We're literally talking about thy kingdom authority in God, what it means to strike the ground. A lot of information I'm going to get to you this morning, and I want you to listen fast, but I want you to hear fast, and I want you to retain fast, Okay. Because I want you to go out here, the world is fast, jump on that lane and get it and live it with confidence of what you know the Word of God has spoken this morning. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of information, but let me just go ahead and summarize the sermon in a nutshell. Okay, strike the ground literally means you and I are to exercise prayer, we are to exercise trust, we are to exercise obedience, listening to the Word of God, and stay faithful no matter what comes our way. When God tells you, we're going to see it in a minute, to strike the ground, strike the ground. When God tells you to pray, pray. When God tells you to obey, obey. When God tells you to walk, walk. When God tells you to stop, stop. When God tells you to to worship, worship. When God tells you to get on your knees, get on your knees. Despite what the world tells you, first time obedience is practicing God and trust and faith and all of that comes out of that obedience. We're going to learn from a king who was a half-hearted king. We're going to learn from a king who wanted a quick fix. We're going to see a lot of us in him. We're going to see a lot of us where where we're, we're facing a battle. And we want God to sort of relieve and and fight the battle for us. And we fight about half of it. And then all of a sudden we see that the Lord is sort of taking over. And then we back off. Like we get into those situations where we cry out to God like, God, I promise, I promise. If you give me this job, I promise I'll read the word. God, I promise, I promise. If you save my marriage, if you do this, if you do I promise, God, I'll go to church every day. Like, God, I promise I'll I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then all of a sudden we start seeing that the, the favor is beginning to happen and we back off. We back off. This is the story that we're looking at today. And if there ever was maybe an attempt at a sermon to wrap up 23 sermons, I think it's this one. So we're in 2 Kings um, chapter 13. And I want you to jump down to verse 14. Now, depending upon what you're reading, uh, paper Bible or electronic, depending upon if it has sort of subheadings over the text, you might actually see that it says the death of Elisha. Okay? Uh, And so that is the ending of, of this part of the story. But it's sort of misleading in the sense that what what happens before that. Okay, so here's what's taking place, uh, if you didn't know this. So Joash is now king. He's a half-hearted king. He follows a line of kings that that are wicked, like the verses before that basically tell you that. That they still follow the ways that were ungodly. They weren't committed. But nonetheless, Joash would occasionally come back and seek God's favor and seek God's blessing. Elisha is now this incredible... An incredible prophet, pastor, if you will, that is God's messenger to the people. God is speaking through him. Joash knows that. 
And Joash now is facing a battle that he knows he cannot win. He, absolutely, he, he knows he's going to be overrun. And he literally comes to Elisha. He also knows that Elisha is near death. Because of his age and the illness that he was dealing with, he knows that Elisha is near death. So he literally comes to Joash and he's like, before this thing gets worse, before, like, I'm in fear right now. Like the prayer I just uh, sort of half recited to you. Like, like God, I, I need you to open this door and I promise if you do this, I promise I'll live for you. Add that times 10. Like, Joash is a king and the people are about to be overrun. And he's now beginning to realize, well, maybe I wasn't as faithful to God as I should uh, things aren't what they ought to be. And so now I need to go back to the man of God and ask for favor from God. And God, would you do this? And this is where we pick up in 2 Kings verse 14, chapter 13, verse 14. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash king of Israel went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it, and Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Notice that. Elisha right now is a typology of God. Meaning when God tells you to do something, you do it. But only at that moment when God comes in and places his hand on our life, only at that moment does our weakness become absolute strength. Okay? You need to see what's happening right now. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hand. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end to them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only Three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. What do we learn from this lesson? Again, a lot of what we learn, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that the Old Testament to you and I now are written so they can be a reminder to you and I. Again, I, I simply summarize it and I say the Old Testament is a book with pictures. It's, it's literally like we can go back and we can see typologies, a typology of something that is like at that moment. So Elisha is like playing the role to you and I like God in our life. So when you and I are facing a battle, facing a struggle, whatever that may be, like Joash, we realize that we are not where we need to be. We've been sort of reluctant or half-hearted or not where, where we should have been in all of our Christian life. And we, at that moment, run back to God and we beg for his forgiveness. God instructs us what to do at that moment. And in that moment, God then puts his hand in that moment. And that's what makes the moment his. So there's so much I want you to see from this. Okay, here's what we know. There, there's always a calling of God on our lives. First and foremost, every one of us, God has called us to himself. That is the very first call. God has called us to himself. God has called us to faith. God has called us to repentance. God has called us to receive him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Like, I'm glad that you're here, but don't just come here and think that this is what church is all about, that it's just religiosity and singing songs and feeling good. No, have you come to that moment when when you... Do you know that when your life ends that you will spend eternity in heaven, not based upon your attendance in church or how you felt in certain moments, But do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, because you've confessed your sins, you've asked for forgiveness, you have called on him as Lord and Savior, do you know at that moment your life has absolutely been changed? For all of us, there's that call. Now, what we've we've been dealing with for all Christians, we know this, this calling, this walk of what we call the Christian life cannot be done alone, which is why Elisha had to put his hand on Joash's hand as he pulled back the bow and lined up the arrow. The calling of parenthood is a high calling. It's a difficult calling. The calling of being married is a high calling. It's a difficult calling. The living out our faith, the calling to be single, the the calling to walk through being a widow or a widower, that that calling is a high calling. The Christian life is nothing but a calling to God. And here's what we learn. You and I have to surrender. We have to depend and we have to absolutely fully obey Or if we only strike the ground half the time, then we'll only win half the battle. And we won't live in thy kingdom come, thy will be done on on earth as it is in heaven. We won't live in full victory. Here's what we know. Here's what we learn. You and I should never lose sight of the fact that when God called people to do something spectacular in the Bible, 
The thing he called them to do was typically larger than themselves and often ridiculous. Very few times have I ever followed God's voice and it didn't seem ridiculous. Now, here we are with the king. And we're going to just think about this. Like he wants him just to, to strike, strike the ground. Now, what does strike the ground mean? If you've watched any level of movies about war and what this means, you've you, you literally seen a guy would take a bow and arrow and he would fling the arrow out. And, and when the arrow hit the ground, that's what it means, strike the ground. That means let the arrow go, aim it. And what it's saying is we're doing this. What that meant to the other enemy, uh, the enemy was, I'm in this now. Like, I, I'm, living the, I'm living my life. Like, we're at war, and I, I acknowledge that. Like, that, that sent the signal. That's what that meant. You and I should not just strike the ground on Sunday morning. Like, every day when you wake up, like, to be honest, that's only 24 times we've heard that sermon bumper, but I don't live by an alarm clock. I just tell myself what time to wake up, and I wake up. But if I had an alarm clock, that would be my alarm clock. Like, that, that sermon bumper music. Like, could you not wake up to, up to that? I'm going to miss that. Can we just play that next Sunday just for fun? I'm just kidding. Not, maybe not. But anyway, here's what we know. Fall, following God is often ridiculous. Think about what he, he's like. I want God to come in and defeat the army. Elisha says, just send an arrow out the window. We're going to go over that in just a moment. But often what God calls us to do is larger than you and I. Being a parent is larger than you and I. Being married is larger than you and I. Following Christ is larger than you and I. Living in Babylon is larger than you and I. Walking into your job as a follower of Christ is larger than you and I. But you, you and I must strike the ground. Here's what we know. Watch. Listen to this. He called Abraham to be the father of a mighty nation. He called David to single-handedly defeat someone twice his size with one small stone. He called Moses to part the Red Sea. He's calling moms and dads to raise kingdom kids. How do we raise godly kids? How do we have a godly marriage? How can we experience the victorious Christian life? Well, we just read what is the kingdom strategy for victorious Christian living. Okay, so let's go over this. What is the, what is the kingdom strategy for victorious Christian living? We already went over this, but Joash was, uh, un, he was facing defeat. He ran to Elisha. Elisha said, Take, pick up your bow, pick up your arrows. Now, I want you to notice this. Um, little confession here. I actually sort of, we purchased this little quiver, and it looked a lot larger on Amazon than it actually was. <laughs> Either that or I still enjoy chocolate ice cream way too much. And I tried to strap it around me, and it probably would barely fit an 11-year-old child. <laughs> so, thankfully, it came with this little doodad here, right? And I'm just going to try to clip it on here. I'm not going to wear this the whole time because I won't be able to run and be Pentecostal. If I do, I'll probably hurt myself. Okay? But notice, notice what we have here. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this to, to, anyway, whatever. All right. Obviously, Joash either walked in with this on him because he was at war, or nonetheless, it was nearby. Here's the point, and I want you to see this, and I, I just have to read this because it's, I think it's on your notes, in your notes. Most of the time, God's promises are in your reach. They are not in your hand just yet, but God requires that we respond with obedience and faith. Everything about what, he, what, the, what the prophet was asking him to do was within his reach. Whether there was a bow already there, whether there was arrows already there, it was all there. That's the whole point of this. God's promises are absolutely within our reach. And God's not going to ask something of you that, number one, is not near you, and number two, that you're not able to respond and that you're not able to fulfill. So I get it. You look at your children. You look at your marriage. You're like, God, I don't have what it takes. You have the promises of God. And when God asks something of you, even how ridiculous that might seem to use that, and it's probably near you, put it in your hand, put it to use, and then just simply say, God, I am absolutely weak, but you're strong. It's not my strength. You never asked me to be strong. You asked me to surrender. You never asked me to be all of that. You asked me to submit and follow you. And so, God, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Listen, most of the time, God's promises are in your reach. Now, hang on. Joash is facing a big problem. Well, let's, let's just not, I mean, if we could put ourselves in that battleground moment, his problem is real. His problem is, is big. 
No matter what you're facing as a parent, it's, it's, it's real. No matter what you're facing in life, it's real. No matter what you're facing in your diagnosis and your health at that moment, it is absolutely real. Don't, don't make a mistake about it. And I know right now you're going, well, God, I'm, I'm, I'm not really good with arrows. I'm not really good with bows. I'm not really good at this or that. Like, this is all new to me. I get it. It's, it's nearby. It's not quite in your hand. Maybe the devil looks at you and says, you know you really stink at archery. Maybe the devil just looks at you and says, well, what about all the mistakes that you made? All the mistakes that you made is what brought you to this point. I get it. But as one old country preacher I heard say years ago, he said, listen, God can always hit his enemy with a crooked stick. When the devil comes in and tells you you're not worth it, you're like, you're not, but God is in me. You're not a good dad, but Christ in me, you are. You're not a good mom, but Christ in you, you are. You're not good and a faithful this or not a faithful... Christ in you, you absolutely are. The promises of God are always in your reach. Put them in your hands and strike the ground. So can we go over this? What then are the arrows of our victory? So we're going to look at the arrows of our victory, the strength of our victory, the moment of our victory, and how to strike the ground. Okay. So what are the arrows of our victory? Well, he literally tells him, take up your bow and arrow. Take up your bow and arrow. The Bible tells us that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So when, when the Bible is describing here, again, these arrows, yes, they were effective at that moment because that's what they were using in the battle. But for you and I, we can't and shouldn't go to work with a bow and arrow and shoot it in the ground, right? Like you, you shouldn't probably show up at your house and shoot an arrow in the wall and say, I proclaim victory in my family. That might freak everybody out. So what are those weapons? What are our arrows? The Bible tells us that from multiple verses. Revelation, the Bible tells us, number one, it's the blood of the Lamb. So what are our arrows? When he tells us to take our arrows, they are the blood of the Lamb. How do they overcome him? That is the evil one. By the blood of the Lamb, by the Word of God, by their testimony, and by prayer. That's just a few that we've listed. So we know that our battle, often we think our battle is with flesh and blood. And often we use flesh and blood means to fight that battle, but it's not. How many times have we said this through this series that, yes, our feet are in this earthly position, but as a follower of Christ, our actual position is in the heavenlies. So the the weapons that we are using are divine. They're not carnal. They're of God. And what are they? This is why you and I must be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Satan, Satan cannot touch you when you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's what it means to be saved. Like God's blood has literally come in and washed you and made you clean and now covers you. It's that covenantal covering, that blessing, if you will, of God. We know that the word of God is our arrow. I'm just telling you right now, you are as successful in your walk as you are successful in reading the word of God. You are as far down the road as you want to be based upon how much time you spend letting the word of God take you down the road. You are as deep in your Christian faith as you are deep in the Word of God. If you are shallow in the Word of God, you're shallow in your walk. If you are shallow in the Word of God, you're shallow in your prayer life. Like you say, well, I don't know what to pray. The more Word of God you get in you, you actually start praying the Word of God. Like He gives you the words to pray. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Pray a promise a day, and you're almost praying a promise for every day of your life. Think about that. Pray the Word of God. Are you in the Word of God? Is the Word of God in you? Or are you and I often like only like Joash, like we, we send up those flare prayers, right? Like, here I am again, God. You know, did you see that flare? Hope you answer me this time. And we only go to the Bible when it's a 911 situation. Corey Tin Boom said this. If you don't know her story, Corey Tin Boom said this. Heaven does not meet in emergency session. In other words, God is not panicking. God doesn't look down at your life and go, oh, my stars. I had no idea it was this bad. (laughs) Or, oh, my stars. My attention was elsewhere. I'm so sorry. Let me come back to you. No, God sees everything. And you and I just need to see him in everything. So what are the weapons? Uh, What are the arrows? Well, they're the word of God. They're your testimony. Now, what is your testimony? Listen, your testimony is not only when you came to Christ. The Bible, when it speaks of salvation, speaks of more of a a present perfect tense. Meaning, when the Bible talks about salvation, it's not just a moment that something happened. It's, are you trusting Christ right now? And that's part of your testimony. 
Like in your, in your job, in your home life, in, in your mental life, in, in, in your faith walk, in, in so many, in your prayer life. What are you trusting God for right now? How are you trusting God right now? That's what builds your testimony. You see, we often think, what, tell me your testimony. Oh, when I was nine years old, I went forward. It's not, it, it is that. But if that's all you have, then it's been a while since you walked with God. Your testimony ought, ought to be, well, yes, I was saved at 9 or 10 or 11, 31, 32. But yesterday I saw God do this. Yesterday I saw God do this. This morning when I woke up, God answered a prayer. This morning when I woke up, I woke up. That's an answer to prayer. Like, right? Like, God, you did this. That is your testimony. And let me tell you, the, the one thing that changes other people's lives is not so much what you believe. It's how you live and how you share your testimony. You can tell people all day long what you believe, but what changes their heart and their life is, is your testimony. I, 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 when, I, when I got on my knees and I began to pray, when I began to trust, when I began to obey, when it was absolutely ridiculous and I believed God for the ridiculous and I stepped out and God said, do this and I did that, God came through. People want to hear that. People want to hear that. They want to see that. What, what then is the strength of our victory? So we know what our arrows are. Don't ever leave those. The blood of the Lamb, Word of God, our testimony, prayer, so much more, but those are few. What then is the strength of our victory? Well, the Bible tells you and I the battle is not yours, it's God's. So often we take the battle on ourselves, and we don't have what it takes. We have what God gives us to accomplish it, but you and I are absolutely weak. Just acknowledge that. 2 Chronicles 20, 15, in so many words says, he says, Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. I'll never forget this verse. It was what we used on the first Sunday when COVID was announced at this great horde that is coming at us. I think it's what started so many things in the life of Waterstone at that moment. Don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Go against them. The Lord will be with you. I love that phrase. Go against them. The Lord will be with you. Like the battle is not yours. It's God's. Understand that. But he, he gives us the promises. He gives us all of those things. You and I just need to reach for them and activate them and utilize it. Once again, notice in the story, when our hand is upon the weapon, his hand must be over ours. I love that. I'd love to have been there in that moment when Elijah, because he was just moments from death. I mean, literally, like after he strikes the ground, he dies. So you, can you imagine how weak he was? And yet at that moment... Elisha steps up in obedience to God, puts his hand on Joash's hand over the arrow and blesses him. Understand this. Please understand this. God absolutely identifies with our obedient weakness. You need to hear that. We often think God steps in with our courageous strength. And he does. He commanded Joshua, have I not called you to be strong and courageous? No doubt he does. But you and I, we take that and we think that it's all about us. It's all about our strength. It's not. It's about our obedient weakness, saying, God, I don't understand this, but I'm going to follow you. God, very little of this makes sense, but I'm going to trust you. God, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I'm fearful of this battle that's ahead of me. I'm fearful of this battle that's waging inside of me. But, Lord, what do you want me to do? Understand this. You see, your weakness... Um, is not a liability. Your weakness is an asset. You get that? Your strength is not an asset. Your strength is a liability. Whenever you come to God and, you, and you're like, God, I got this. God's like, well, this isn't going to go that well. <laughs> but whenever you come to God and you're like, God, I'm absolutely, I'm weak and I, I'm dependent upon you. Like, be my strength. Be everything to me that I know needs to be in me at this moment for this moment. So, God, I surrender to you. God, I'm about to walk into this boardroom. I'm about, I'm about to walk into my son or daughter's bedroom. I'm about to walk into my house. I'm about to step into this situation. I'm about to come out of this situation. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But, God, I am obedient to you. And right now, I don't have what it takes, but I need you in me to give me what it takes. Listen to the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Paul ends it and says, when I am weak, that's when I am strong. When I am weak, that's when I am strong. I love this quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Listen to this. God does not need our strength. God calls for our obedience. God identifies himself with our obedient weakness. You say, I'm too weak to win the battle. I love this. Listen, you may not be weak enough yet. You may not have realized just how weak 
you need to be. Isn't that so true? You and I will always fail in some areas as a parent. We will always fail in some ways as a follower of Christ. We will always face struggles. There's, there's, there's never a day when God says, you know what, I'm really busy today. Like, again, you've got this. There's enough in you. There's never a day that you and I can live without his strength. And therefore, there should never be a day when you and I aren't obedient in our weakness. Every morning, you should get up and just say, God, if you can forgive me, forgive me. If you can use me, use me. If you can fill me, fill me. I have no idea I'm going to face this day. I have no idea I'm going to walk through this task. I don't have the words to say. I don't have the emotions to handle it. I don't have the capacity to make it. But you and me do. So, Father, in Jesus' name right now, I'm asking you, fill me, use me, overwhelm me, anoint me for this task. Give me your strength. I submit everything that's weak about me because when I do that, you turn that weakness into strength. Put your hand on my life. Pray that. What then is our moment of victory? Don't miss this one. What is our moment of victory? Did you notice four words there? Or he says, open the window eastward. We call this, I call this our, our window of opportunity. Why was that so significant? Well, one, it's where the enemy was. Syria was east. In the Bible, east always represents the enemy. Did you understand that? As far as the east is from the? You see that, right? That represents our sinfulness, our waywardness. You see, why, why is that so significant? Well, of course, for Joash, it was where the enemy was. But what is he saying there? Please don't miss this. He's saying, we must expose the place of your fear. Expose the place of your failure. Expose the place of your doubts. There are areas in your lives that we don't want to face. And God, God, God through Elisha is looking at him and he's saying, over there is the enemy. And what I want to do is I want to run to you, the prophet, and I want you to take care of it. And God says, no, I want you to turn to the enemy and I want you to strike the ground. You see, is there something in your life that you've yet to give to God? That you're just praying, Lord, just take it. And maybe he hasn't, maybe he will, but maybe in, a, in another moment. Are there failures you've yet to face? Are there struggles you've yet to come sort of face to face with and just say, God, one of the biggest struggles in my life is doubt. And right now, Lord, I'm going to face my doubt by believing in you. One of the biggest areas of my life, maybe for you, is trust. Maybe it's first-time obedience. Maybe it's God has called you to go on a mission. Maybe he's called you to serve. Maybe he's called you to give. Maybe he's called you to pray for someone. And you've yet to do that because that's a fear of yours. Like, that's not what I do, God. That's ridiculous. You want me to go over and pray for a coworker? I'm going to look like a fool. Well, be a fool for Christ. You want me to do this with my children? That's, I don't understand that. We'll, we'll do that. You want me to give? You want me to serve? You want me to step out? You want me to go? Listen, you cannot get to where you need to be by staying in your comfort zone. You can't do it. This is uncomfortable for Joash. He, just, he knew he was backslidden. He knew he was not where he needed to be because the last thing he wanted to do was face his enemy. That's why he ran away from it. But Elisha says, open that window eastward. Face your enemy, shoot an arrow, and say, we're in this. How do we know that? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Face your failures in Christ. Face your fears in Christ. Face your weakness in Christ. Open that window eastward and say, in Christ, I'm going to live for Christ. And by his power, I'm going to live for Christ. What have you yet to lay down? what habit, what addiction, what thought life, what moment, what failure are you still maybe even utilizing as a crutch, as a fallback that you don't want to go back to? Like, you, you, if, I, if I stay there, then I, I'm not going to be able to move. Yeah, move forward. Let go of it. What have you yet to face? Every one of us have failures in our lives we need to face. I'm just telling you right now, starting Friday and Saturday, I feel the weakest physically, emotionally, mentally I ever feel all week long. Like you would think I was dying. Well, not really, but whatever. Like, you know, like, but it's at that moment, I'm telling you, and you would think I've been doing this for I don't know how many years, and no matter how many years I do it, I still get to that moment where I'm like, God, why in the world did you call me? I'm the biggest doofus here. Like, there's no way. Like, how? Like, I don't understand this. 
But in that moment, I'm down there praying, God, you've got to forgive me. God, you've got to fill me. You've got to use me. This is my calling. And if I'm not doing this, I don't have a reason to exist. And so, Lord, I'm about to step up there. I'm going to run up there, and I hope you meet me there. I mean, I'm literally praying that. Like, God, meet me there. Let this be all about you. What have you yet to face? Like Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, maybe you're not weak enough yet. Like you're still holding on to some area of life that you think well, God, God will honor that area of that life where you're holding. Let go of it. Let go of your hangups. Let go of your habits. Let go of those things. Let go of them and just surrender them to God. God can do a much better job of taking care of you than you could ever take care of yourself. And trust him with that. Here's what we learn from Joash because he was half-hearted. A little Religion is a very dangerous thing. It allows you just enough awareness, knowledge, ability to at least show up to the game, but you don't really have enough strength to get out there and do it. Okay, so I, I, I stunk at baseball. You guys know that. If you didn't, well, you know it now. I did. And all my family was, were awesome at it. I, I was decent at soccer, and so I played soccer almost my entire you know, childhood and, and so forth. So I, I played soccer. Um, but I dated a girl, and she was a cheerleader, and she had made the, J, J, the junior varsity team. And I'm like, oh, I got to be where she's at. I stunk at basketball, but I played basketball just so I could ride the bus with the girl I was dating because she was a cheerleader. And I'm telling you, I put on the uniform, but I prayed, do not put me in the game. I literally prayed that. I'm like, I didn't care. I didn't care if I sat at the bench. I didn't care. I was looking at her. I was like, yeah, we're winning, you know? <laughs> Right? I didn't care. I didn't care. And I'll never forget the moment where the coach leans forward and says, Ron! And I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Like, I, I'll ne- I mean, I'll never. I'm like, no, he called, he, he called Don. He called Rob. He called Juan. He called somebody else. Not, he called my name. I went in. And I was like, now this is going to be embarrassing in front of the whole school. Anyway, I didn't do that bad. But, I mean, anyway... I'm just, I can, I can remember that moment where I was like, don't call my name. Have you ever felt like that? God, I want to serve you, but don't call my name in this area. God, I want to serve, I want to, I want to live for you, but don't call my name in this area. I want the uniform. I don't, even mind, I don't even mind sitting on the bench. But in these areas, don't put me in the game, coach. Right? God wants to call you to live for him. And in those areas where you have the uniform and you're sitting on the bench, a little religion's a dangerous thing. You need to live out the faith that only Christ can live out in you if you will practice obedience to him. Here's what we need. Like Joash, we have little victories that get us through the day instead of total victories that blow our mind. You need those victories where your name gets called And you get put into the game. Can I tell you what happened? It only happened once. I have to tell it. We were losing. And at the end of the game, we we were losing. And and they they threw the ball to me. And I was in the corner. I was like, okay. (sighs) Made it. Three-pointer. We won by one point. Yeah. And this is a guy that stunk at basketball. But, you know, for that day, I was a hero. Every every other game after that, I was a zero. But nonetheless, (laughs) I had my moment. And felt good. My point is get in the game. Get off the bench. If you're coming here this morning and you're just attending church, that's just sitting on the bench. I'm glad you're here. You've got the uniform, but get off the bench. Step out to be a faithful dad. Step out to be a faithful mom. Step out to be a faithful employee. Step out to be a faithful follower of Christ. You say, I I don't even know where the books of the Bible are. You know what? Just open up the Bible. Can I tell you where to begin? Begin in the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then jump over to the book of Ephesians. Then jump over to the book of Galatians. Then jump over to the book of James. Don't start in the book of the Revelation. (laughs) Don't start there. Don't start in Leviticus. Right? Don't start there. You know, don't start in the book of Malachi. It's 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 Malachi, not Malachi. He wasn't an Italian prophet. (laughs) Right? Don't start in those books. Start in the Gospel of John. Start there. And then you know what? Sprinkle in Psalms, sprinkle in Proverbs. Honestly, after you get about that far, read all the Proverbs. It's the, it's the greatest wisdom literature ever given to you and I. You can practice that every day of your life. But get off the bench. Strike the ground. Get in the game. Strike the ground. That's our next point. What do I mean by that? Be wholehearted. 
Not like Joash, half-hearted. Be courageous. Courageous in believing. Courageous in doing. Courageous in becoming. Courageous in trying. Courageous in living. How many Christians have little faith? And they seem to be content with little faith. Here's what I like about it. Can I do this? I promise I won't hurt anybody, but I also promise I won't hurt me. Well, I can't promise that, but whever, we'll try. Can I can we just try this? First I gotta find my belt loop. Here's the deal with this. We know that the the quiver obviously held more than three, because he tells him that. He says, strike the ground, and then he says he struck the ground three times. But then he goes on to say, Well, you could have struck the ground five or six times. So, you know, I won't put an arrow on here, right? But for afraid that it might go somewhere. Um, you're over there, buddy. I got you, right? Uh, uh, he can handle it. Well, maybe, but you know what I mean. So here, here's what you and I do. We're like, oh, okay, okay, God, I'll do that. I'll pull back. I'm trying to hit my microphone. I'll pull back, and we release an arrow. We do another one. We pull another one out. Let me just, let me just pull out three. Let me just, yes, because that's how many times that he struck. Let me just pull out three. And then he's like, Done. How many of us are like that? Like we fling one prayer. We fling another prayer. Fling another prayer. Like, okay, God, I read your word today. Okay, God, I prayed. I get it. I mean, that's good. But keep striking the ground. Keep praying when you don't feel like praying. Keep praying even when you don't think prayers are being answered. Keep walking even though you might not be able to see the path. Keep trusting even if you can't see his hand, trust his heart, Spurgeon said. Keep believing in your kids. Keep being faithful to your children. Keep praying for your children. Keep praying for your job. Keep striking the ground. Put another arrow in and strike the ground. Put another arrow in and strike the ground. Just keep, just keep on striking. Keep sending down the arrows. Here's what he says. If he asks you to shoot on the ground, shoot on the ground. You may not see an enemy, but every time you shoot, that arrow finds the heart of the enemy. When you pray, the Bible tells you and I, prayer moves mountains. It, faith moves mountains. Obedience moves mountains. You and I don't move the mountains. God moves them based upon our obedience and our faith and our prayer. Listen, when you strike the ground, you're just aiming it out the eastward window. You may not even see it hit the ground. How many prayers have we sent up and we're like, Lord, did you hear it? Lord, Lord, did I need to do that again? Like, did I say it wrong? How many times have you instructed your children and you're like, did you hear it? How many times have you talked to others? How many times have you and I attempted to walk, attempted to read, and attempted to pray? Keep striking the ground. Keep praying. Stay in the word. Stay in the blood. Stay in prayer. Stay faithful. Let God build your testimony. Strike the ground. What is, a, what is it a call to? It's a call to pick up your bow. It's a call to pick up your bow. The bow here literally is our instrument of faith. The arrow are the word, are the are the the enemy. The arrows are, the, are what we use towards the enemy. You just start with faith. You start with your weakness. And I'll get it. I don't know what draw this is. I think it's about a fifty or sixty pound draw, or maybe more than that. To be honest, I had to practice again in the office. I don't want to go out there like junior varsity. Like I can't pull the thing back. Right? Like. Okay, faith is just like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger you become. The more you use it, the stronger you become. And it just becomes absolutely natural. I get it. How many times we come to God in prayer and we're like, God, would you, can you? And then we just kind of flop the arrow out there, right? Don't confess this out loud, but how many of you have ever taken an antibiotic and felt better after day three of day 10 and quit on day three? Don't confess that, right? Because you know it's actually bad for your body to do that, okay? But here's what we know. How many of us will, will pray for three days and stop? We'll read the Bible for three days and we'll stop. We'll walk with God for three days and we'll stop. We'll shoot one arrow and we will stop. The Bible is telling you to launch all your arrows. Send them all. Get all your arrows out. This, these arrows could be your children. 
The Bible says a quiver full of children. Happy is the father that has a quiver full of them. But the Bible tells you now that that heir, that child is to be sent. Like release them and send them. Launch. Don't. I get it. I get it. There's, there's a little bit of comfort. Like, go, go back to that. I get it. There's comfort in that. Like, I have six arrows, and I've, I've launched three. And maybe I'm thinking, well, God, that's good enough. Well, what happens when I leave the prophet's presence, and I go out, and I want to continue to fight? Like, I get it. There, there's a little bit of comfort to, to sort of hold back some weapons. Don't hold back on prayer. Don't hold back in trust. Don't hold back in obedience. God doesn't honor half-hearted obedience. God doesn't honor half-hearted prayers. God doesn't honor a half-hearted walk. Send them all. Send every one of these and give it all you got. Pray and don't stop praying for your children. Pray and don't stop praying for your faith. Pray and don't stop praying for your marriage. Pray and don't stop praying for your friends. Pray and don't stop praying. Trust God. Trust God. Walk with God. Walk with God. Believe in God. Read the word of God. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Bible says send all the arrows. There's one last point. It's interesting because when I first read this, can I... Here's, here's the thought I had. So the Bible tells us that Elisha got mad at Joash. Now, as a pastor, can I be honest? I've been mad before. I've sat with people, and I've told them exactly what to do to get themselves out of the mud. And I come back and see them a week later, and they're still taking a bath in the mud. And I'm like, why in the world did I, you know, like, I want to be like Elisha, like, stop it. Like, stop it. Stop it now. Like, be faithful, be obedient, trust God. But the Bible says Elisha got mad at him. That's an interesting term. It's not that, Lord, that God gets mad at us in that sense, but God is like, if you only knew what would continue to happen if you just continued to launch the arrows. If you only knew what Elisha's trying to do here, believe it or not, encouraging is to, is to encourage a half-hearted king. What God is always trying to do in your life and in my life, the reason why he sends the things that he does to send our way is to encourage us not to be half-hearted because God knows that a little religion is dangerous. No wonder Elisha was angry with him because he knew, like, you've only won half the battle. You're going to be back here, but I'm not going to be here for you in that moment. So here's the question. The question for Joash is the same for us. Would he faithfully apply himself to the appointed task? The fact that he struck the ground only three times revealed the type of man he was. Faithless. Half-hearted. Lacking in courage. The question for Joash is the same question for all of us. Will you strike the ground? Will you be wholehearted? Will you be courageous? Courageous in believing, courageous in doing, courageous in becoming, courageous in trying, and courageous in living. I know right now the odds may be stacked against you medically, financially, emotionally. Maybe right now you're just looking at the battles with your, your children. or I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. And, and maybe you shot one prayer out. And maybe you went ahead and shot a second one out. Maybe you shot a third. Okay, God, I don't know where we're going with this. Keep striking the ground. Keep sending the arrows. Trust God with your children. Trust God with your family. Trust God with your finances. Trust God with the faith that he's developing in you. Trust the promises of God. Trust the word of God. We live in Babylon, folks. You got to keep sending the arrows. You got to keep sending the arrows. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever stop trusting. Don't ever stop walking. Do not become half hearted. Do not become callous. Do not become cold. Stay on fire for Christ. Keep walking. Keep trusting. Keep praying. Keep believing. Strike the ground. Strike the ground. Strike the ground. When God tells you to obey, obey. When God tells you to walk, walk. When God tells you to stop, stop. When God tells you to get on your knees, get on your knees. When God tells you to raise your hands, raise your hands. When God tells you to give, give. When God tells you to go, go. When God tells you to trust, trust. When God tells you to part the waters, part the waters. When God tells you to walk through dry ground, walk on dry ground. When God tells you to grab 12 stones and make them as a monument, make them a monument. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. Do it. And don't hesitate, and don't wait, and don't delay. Strike the ground.
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We live in victory. In Christ, we live in victory. It's been given to us. Walk in it. Believe in it. Trust him for it in every moment. Amen. Amen.